Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to our Libra Solar Festival webinar. My name is Alexander, and I welcome you on the behalf of the 2025 initiative. Thank you for joining our circle today. And as we will be meditating with the energies of Libra, our guest today, Michael Lindfeld, will lead us in the journey of exploring of the new story. Hello, Michael. Hello, Sasha. Hello, Alexander. Thank you for joining the circle today and thank you for being there always in our subjective circle. Thank you. So please lead us in our meditation, in our alignment. Thank you. Before we go into an alignment, let, let me just read the note that was sounded that called together this particular webinar. And the, the story goes as follows. The new story lives in st inside the spiritual DNA of the soul of humanity as the divine plan. At present, most of the world is captured inside the gravitational pull of an old narrative that no longer serves. We are witnessing a time of great awakening, liberation and renewal, preceded by the chaos of an old order in upheaval and dissolution. And the time we're going to be spending together now will be an opportunity to go deeper and to explore what it means to craft a new script and be fully committed and engaged inside a multi-dimensional planetary project to build and bless a new earth. So that's the convening note. And in our alignment, we will simply create a cohesive, coherent field in which we can be impressed by the new story. So let us begin by entering the deep silence of the heart. Feeling the pulse of our own heartbeat. As the blood pumps and circulates around our universe of self, our incarnated vehicle. And at the center of each heart, there burns a flame of love. Stand in this flame and stand as this flame. and feel the warmth and illumination of this fire of love expanding with every breath until it fills your whole being. And we connect these many fires, heart, to heart, to heart, to heart. Creating the chalice that is our group heart. And into this chalice 
we receive impressions from the deep heart of the life of this planet. So as we enter a silent receptive time together, let us imagine that the deep desire of the Logos is transmitted as a note of purpose. And it, this note impresses itself upon the sensitive substance that is the realm of the soul and takes shape as the living plan, the new story. So let us be receptive and invite the new story to live in our group heart. And we sense the joyful expectancy of this new birth. Knowing that it requires our wholehearted engagement. We are the outworking of the plan. We are the telling and the living of the new story. So returning again to the heartbeat, to the breath, we focus again inside our incarnated self, knowing that the subtle realms are ever present. So let us begin this journey together. If there is a new story that is seeking to express itself through us, then it requires a clean sheet of paper on which to be written. It requires a field that is not conditioned by the past. And so I believe the first act of living the new story is to ensure that the old story that no longer serves, no longer dictates our actions, our thoughts, our feelings. And as we look around, we see a world in turmoil. A lot of these structures and systems that are in place are formulations of an old story. They no longer serve the whole of life and they're breaking down. 
that isn't just an outer event. What I've been looking at this past year inside myself is what are the structures, what are the systems, what are the thoughts, the feelings inside my own universe of self that no longer serve? And so what I wish to do now is to invite us to explore an act of releasing the old story, clearing the space and stepping in to the new story. The keynote of this past year in my life has been liberation. I began by calling it freedom and then I realized it was something deeper, liberation. And so liberation for me, when I've reflected on this, it means liberation is the freedom on the physical plane from all addictions, all the needs to possess things. On the emotional plane, it's the liberation from emotional attachments and those painful patterns that seem to distort the truth of who I am when it comes out and shows up on the outside. And also the need to possess people the emotional attachments. And then there is the liberation from the conditioning of the mental plane and the need to possess a fixed version of the truth, which we called a belief. So that's the sort of process I've been going through this past year. And in conversation with a number of my colleagues, um, some of you are on this particular call, we've shared stories and we realize that we'd be going through the same thing. It seems as though we've entered a period of total disorientation at one level in order to clear a space for something new to come in. So what I wish to do now is just to give us an opportunity to acknowledge what the work that needs to be done. I think many of us have realized that in order to address something, first it has to be named then it has to be accepted. And then we have to take responsibility for it. So this is an opportunity just to, to notice a name, to accept and agree to take responsibility for it in, in our own lives. So let's start with the easy ones. <laughs> let's reflect for a moment on our own physical material life. Think of all the things that you own, as we say, I own these things, these things are my possessions. And as you review what you have, without blame or judgment, just say, what are the things that are no longer are needed that I can let go of? Recycle, upcycle, give away. Or they may be things I need to retain. So just do a quick scan of your material world. Are the things that you believe well, I really should let go of that, but no, I can't because there are so many fond memories and I really need this, I, whatever it is. And there's nothing good or bad about this. It's simply noting the stage we're at, the attachments that we have to our physical world. So having noted that and accepted that yeah, this is the state of affairs. Let's focus now on the emotional body, the astral plane. What are some of the emotional attachments that we still notice? What are some of the patterns that seem to be driving us that really don't do justice to who we are? So just lovingly view your own 
emotional body. And do an inventory of what is present. So letting go of emotional attachments occurs over the course of many lifetimes, as we know. And it may be that we're coming closer to the final liberation in this lifetime, or it may be that there are several lifetimes left. It really doesn't matter. For me, the, the important thing is that we're committed to the process of liberation. And liberation so that we have a greater capacity to carry out divine purpose. So that was the physical and emotional. The next level, the mental plane, probably is the most challenging. This is the one that I've bumped into that has caused me the most uh, grief. Because I suddenly realized that I have a belief that my beliefs are the truth. And I sort of, I, I caught myself, oh my gosh. And then I realized all of our beliefs are simply the closest approximation to the truth that we can ascertain at this time based on our stage of development and the degree of environmental conditioning in this life and from pre previous lives. And um, often when we discover, oh my gosh, um, this is a limiting view, this is a limiting belief. There's a great fear of letting go of it because it gives us meaning and it gives us a sense of belonging. And I, I'm going to give you an example of, of this that I've noticed in my life. And then I'm going to invite us to share what we've noticed in our own lives. So when we think about a belief, it's, it's our idea of what we believe to be true. And a lot of my beliefs and ideas came from my studies, uh, reading the, the Bailey books, reading the Agni Yoga books, reading Theosophy, reading Steiner, reading all kinds of philosophical uh, food. And I built up, if you like, a model or a map of life. And so, I created a belief of what the world is based on the models that I had taken on board. And what happened a year ago, I realized that it's so true when we say the map is not the territory. So instead of holding a mental picture of what my relationship is with the universe, I needed to shift from my head to my heart. I needed to establish, deepen, and maintain what I call a resonant relationship with, with truth that bypasses a belief. And I'm in the process of letting go of what I believe to be true and daring to enter a space of what Agni Yoga calls direct communion, where we are part of that which is the truth the truth lives in us and we live in it. And that really is the liberation that I'm, I'm sensing. And if we go back to what we believe to be true as the new group of world servers, sometimes we get into arguments about um, technical things, about the subplanes or where this being lives and, or doesn't live. Or, so. And what has happened to me is that I've let go of a particular model. For instance, instead of viewing the various planes of consciousness as a layer cake or a neat stack of pancakes with sort of one on top of the other. And this is the way that I interpreted the um, models that were presented in the esoteric literature. 
I now have a sense of these planes and dimensions coexisting as what I would call an entangled order. This is an interwoven tapestry of su subtle threads, and it forms this living organism, this, this living being. And therefore, uh, when I think, for instance, of the kingdom of souls, the, um, the fifth kingdom, in my old model, it was several floors above me. If, if I were living in a skyscraper, I was on, on, on some of the bottom floors and, and uh, the, the masters were living close to the top floor because the, uh, the penthouse suite was, uh, was Shambhala. And so it was like, well, I, could, I can never relate to, to these, these beings because we live on different floors. They're much higher. And one day I, I will move house and I'll be able to live on this uh, higher, more elevated floor. And when I let go of this view of the world as a stack of pancakes <laughs> and realize that this entangled order really is the way that love organizes itself, no longer was I separated by distance in a model. I actually could begin to feel the love that emanated from that realm. And therefore, our elder brothers and sisters were no longer up there and out of reach. They didn't live on the top floor. They were indeed, as we're told, nearer than hands and feet and closer than breathing. So I use this as an example of just a letting go of a model of a mental image and I find it incredibly liberating because it allows me to include all that I'm experiencing. So I invite us now just to reflect what in the last six to 12 months has happened or is happening in your life where there is a shift in how you view things, a shift in your beliefs. Let's reflect on that too for a for a moment together. And what I'll invite us to do is we have a chat box on the screen for you to, or for us to share with each other throughout the course of this webinar, insights. And remember to post to all. And that every now and again, we're gonna stop and we're gonna spend like 10 minutes and invite probably six or seven people just to briefly share maybe a two minute input, one minute input, so we get a flavor of what is moving throughout our field, because I believe that what one of us is experiencing, we're all experiencing, maybe in a slightly different way, but the, this call for the liberation and the call to stand in a new open receptive space is being registered by us. And it would be interesting and valuable just to hear from each other how it's showing up in our own lives. So, Alexander, what I'd like to do now is to invite and say, give us 10 minutes and invite anybody just to speak briefly, maybe a couple of sentences to what's shifting in your life around the liberation of the mental plane or, or however you're framing it. And this way we can get a sense of what's happening in the field and this will inform the rest of our conversation together, rest of our dialogue. So whenever you want to speak, please press, press the, the hand um, item or the emblem and um, Alexander or Daniela will, will let you speak. And um, we'll listen to what we have to say together. We'll breathe it in and then we'll continue our exploration.
So either use the chat box to write something or raise your hand and uh, speak. There is a raised hand, so are we ready to open the floor, Michael? Absolutely, yes. Hello, Michael. This is Robin. Hi, Robin. Hi. I'm not accustomed to speaking about these things out loud, so I'll try to um, be succinct as you've requested. The way I experience what I believe you're talking about in terms of liberation from mental models is when I am working on the inner planes, I notice that I can keep myself confined if my inner eye keeps looking at those mental models and sorting through them visually, or I can let go of that and step into the experiencing of what that model is trying to convey to me. Step into the relationship and I have to move out of the intellect and into the heart and experience it that way. Thank you, Robin. That's exactly what I've been experiencing. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you. Hi, John. Thank you, Alex. This is John Horan. And in the last year, really, I've experienced a very deep urging to let go of the outworn, whether that's a physical structure or a method of perception. And this has played out in all the realms, whether it's interactions with others or, or the material. I'm always reminded by what the Tibetans said about the nature of evil, which is the nature of evil is often outworn good. And so this helps me to get a greater appreciation and understanding of these practices or possessions that once had a purpose. That purpose may have been fulfilled, superseded, and it's time to let go. And that's what I've been working on. So I thank you for the opportunity to share that with the group. Thank you. And thanks for the music. <laughs> You're, you're welcome. I'm working on my show right now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so Hi, Margo. Is... Yeah. Uh, Margo, please unmute yourself. I've noticed over the past year that desire itself is falling away. I, I no longer eat meat. Uh, desire to be right or accurate is falling away. But primarily, a shift from the belief and the structure that's come from reading the Tibetan to, to an actual experiencing of the subtle realms and this continues to unfold in a deeper and more profound way. And I notice when a structure, a former mental structure, starts to impose itself and the ability to bring myself back into the moment is, is strengthening, as well as the um, the subtle is becoming more substantial. Thanks, Margo. Let's continue the sharing and just see what else, what other colors and nuances are showing up for us on this theme. There is a comment from Sharon uh, 
all Larky, or of love, and we are each and all a part of it. Another sharing from Karen, and I will um, put it in the chat. Liberation is the perfect description for the experiences of the past year and a profound blending with the planetary life, pure joy. It's amazing. We had music and now we have sirens. The, the, these are the two worlds we're living in. It's, it's, it's quite amazing. Um, we, we live in two worlds simultaneously. Um, one that is dissolving and the other it is emerging on the form level. However, what we're tuning into is the, the eternal story that seeks to express itself age after age through different civilizations. And uh, we're being impressed uh, to express the story in this new civilization that we are privileged to help initiate. But being in the transition period, we also are first responders to those who are suffering. Mm pain, dissolution, and we're also the, the sowers of the seeds. So we're first responders to the pain of the old, and we're the, the sowers of the seed of the new. Sometimes within the, same, within the same day or the same hour. So let's hear a, a few more of what's moving as far as liberation, particularly the mental plane, which I believe is the, probably the toughest challenge for for all of us because we've stuck because we've studied so much and um, have constructed many maps and models and so I realized that uh, there was a lot to let go of to get to what both Robin and Margot described as a, a direct experience so if anyone else wishes to share please do so now before we continue There is another sharing on the chat uh, from Jen. I seem to be investigating what exactly I am responsible for. For some reason, I feel a need to clarify this is this in in my experience. I wish to fully engage with the responsibility of my soul direction, but it doesn't seem congruent to the rest of my life. Or maybe it's my resistance. We have time for one other person or two other people if you wish to share by voice. It was for a second the hand raised by Dar uh, Dacia. If you'd like to speak again, please raise your hand. And I see Margo raise your hand again. You are muted on your own. And yes, Dacia, I will unmute you just in a second. Thank you. Hello, Michael. This is Daisha in Victoria. Oh, hi there. Um, at the planet within the gathering in Italy this summer, there was a deep shift in my personal understanding of in relationship to Gaia. And that has colored and informed every aspect of my life since then. And largely it was letting go of mental constructs around who I thought I was, and deepening my relationship to, to 
to group, but also to the very essence of the planet. So it's been a time of integration and deepening and richening of an experience that began then and is ongoing. And for me, that's that's the living news story coming to life. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah. There are a few more comments uh, that I'm reposting uh, in the chat box because they come to the question section that only organizers can see. So I'm reposting them so you can uh, you. see them. And Margot, if you would like to say something else, please unmute yourself. Thanks, Alexander. I don't have anything else to add. I believe all of us sort of sense the task ahead. Uh, it's to joyfully dismantle because these things have served us. And this is what we realize identification does. We identify with something and then we need to disidentify with it because it served its time. All forms are temporal. And therefore, um, as, as was said, uh, evil is good that is uh, out, outworn its welcome, <laughs> it no longer serves. Um, and so this act of liberation that we sense that we're part of is not just for ourselves. We're liberating ourselves so that we can become a more responsive and responsible living aspect of Gaia or the life of the Logos, the life of the planet. And it's so easy to stand outside and wonder, how do I relate to the planet? The fact is, we are the living planet. And it's allowing that knowing to flood us with the realization that everything that I think, say, and do affects everything else. I believe that the new group of world service is being asked to go through this process of liberation because humanity as a whole, as we've been told, for the first time is facing an initiation together, the first initiation. And we know that there are two phrases that we associate with this first initiation. The one is we cannot live by bread alone because as we have read in from Bethlehem, to Calvary, um, Bethlehem is the house of bread. And so that's where uh, the Christ presence was born. And yet you can't just live in Bethlehem. You can't just live in matter. And we're told that the first initiation, the full flowering of it occurs when Christ is born within the cave of the human heart. So it's that eternal Christ presence. And if you're going to talk about thought forms and mental models, we could spend probably a year on the Christ. I, I would ask us when we say Christ to allow the presence of that being to unconditionally fill us with its truth and so that we can enter into a new relationship with it. So the process of liberation is what DK refers to as the dimming of the 18 fires, which is the final struggle to free ourselves from the gravitational pull of the lunar petries before the, the one fire of the, the solar angel burns at the heart of all we think, say, and do. And so the seven fires of the physical plane, the seven fires of the astral plane, and the four lower fires of the mental plane, these are the fires that need to be dimmed so that the one solar fire can be ignited. And then the phrase that we're so familiar with, may the soul control the outer form. No longer is the form controlling the life. 
the lunar petries no longer have sway, the, the lunar lords. And so you can look at this as a psychological exercise we're going through, or you can look at this as a deep ritual of liberation at a planetary level, whereby the degree to which we free ourselves and are able to be responsive to the call of the solar angel and not be pulled by the lunar lords, to that degree, we allow the planet itself to circulate its purpose and for it to be expressed. So the living story for me requires the deconstructing of the old story that no longer serves. So that was just an example of, of, a, of a mental model or, or letting go of beliefs. So I'm sure each of us experienced it in different ways. The way I felt it this past year was I was shedding a skin. I was so attached to this skin. This skin was how I showed myself to the world. It was like having a skin full of tattoos. And that really is a great analogy because I've often wondered with people with tattoos, what happens if you change your mind next year and say, oh, no, that's not the image I want to, to portray. Well, what do you do? You're stuck with it for the course of this lifetime unless you go through a very painful process of removal. So if you like, we have tattooed things on our mental body, on our mental skin. And then we shed those and we have the opportunity to be open, to be impressed. And then we create new thought forms, new mental models of a higher order. So it's a process of disidentification and then a process of identification with something of a higher order. And then after a period of time, that too will need to be let go of because all forms the temporal. So this brings me to the next area I invite us to explore, which is liberation from the conditioning of time. And uh, I know that we've read in, in the blue books when DK talks about, well, our experience of time is simply a brain function. <laughs> it isn't really that way. Um, my relationship with time this past year is shifting. And one of the reasons is that I've been viewing life through the eyes of Kairos and not just Kronos. So these, these two representations of time. For me, Kronos is what I call tick-tock time. It measures minutes, months, years. It's a quantitative um, aspect of time. And it's often something I see as external and happening to me. I look at the clock and I gosh, I've only got 10 more minutes, I better hurry. And it conditions my life because it seems to be external. Kairos, on the other hand, refers to a natural cycle of nourishment that is needed to bring something to fruition and therefore is qualitative. Therefore, Kairos for me is something internal and happening through me, not to me. So as we said, when the soul controls the outer form, then it imposes its rhythm on the earthly life. And this rhythm, I believe, is really the spirit of Kairos. So I've given up worrying about how many years I spend on a particular project, how many years I live in this house or don't live in this house or in this relationship or not. It's not about Kronos time. For me, right time is whatever is required to complete the seasonal cycle so that the seed of purpose is sown, it can grow and eventually flower and then be harvested so that new seeds that are the product of that season uh, can be taken and planted again in the coming season. So I invite us now to reflect on our relationship with time. What's your relationship to Kronos? 
what I call tick-tock time. There's nothing derogatory in that remark. It simply means it's a, it's a quantitative measure of the passing of time. How is your daily life? Do you have enough time? I know I've often joked when people say, I, I don't have enough time or enough, not enough hours in the day. And I sort of said to them, oh, I'm terribly sorry. Weren't you given the 24 hours that the rest of us were given? It's a question of how we utilize the time. And I believe it was St. Augustine who said, time is simply that in which to find God. Now let's reflect on our life as Kairos. We're inside a cycle of time. Beginnings, middles, ends. Those are the three phases we know about a cycle. It begins, it matures, and it disintegrates and dissolves. So what is it in your life at the moment that you're living inside that doesn't feel constrained by time? You're actually establishing the rhythm of your life rather than being controlled by what you perceive as the lack of time. Do you have these distinctions? For instance, this webinar is 90 minutes long. But does that mean I keep looking at the clock and saying, oh my gosh, there's only another half an hour to go or another 40 minutes or 30 minutes and adapting my behavior and my conditioning to the clock? Or do I surrender into the space that time has given us and trust that we together will go through a cycle of exploration that will nourish us and bring us into deeper resonant relationship with life. So with liberation comes surrender. So what has been happening in your relationship with time? And let's do what we did before. Let's use the chat box to share. And then whoever wishes to express that in words, just please raise your hand electronically. And Alexandra will open your microphone and you can share. So we're told that we will have a new relationship with time. That's one of the things that we know this coming era will offer us. And I believe that we are already sensing that and attempting to live into it. And part of the liberation for me has been the liberation from the, from the domination of Kronos and the surrender into the nurturing embrace of Kairos. So whenever we're ready, let's share some more with each other. Uh, Katya, you're unmuted. Please unmute yourself. Yes. Um, hello, everybody. Hi, Michael. Um, it's interesting because once I read that uh, Saturn created time, right? Brother created time. 
for his other brothers to be able to join him eventually, right? And that triggered a whole new understanding of what time and time serves the purpose. And it can be, for me, Kronos or Kairos, depending on what, what is, depending on what's the purpose. Yes, exactly. And, and humanity, we're in, you know, this, I think it's correlated with the mental plane because again, um, we're not experiencing that for for a long time as a, as as a as a collective, right? It's with the invention of the clock, right? We start measuring it in a certain way, and then it came to the point of efficiency and things like that. But a rhythm, I think that's the picking up the rhythm. But it's interesting because as soon as I'm getting scared of time, not having enough time, the time goes like, ooh, melting. And then in certain moments of my life, I definitely know that if I need the time suffice, it will. And um, that's the state of the, it's where I polarized, basically. Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah. yeah. Thank you. That. So, what else? Uh, there are people who are posting on the chat. If you can go to that as well, and also, if anyone else wants to share, please raise your hand and then speak when unmuted. Hello, Doug. Thank yes. Thank you, Alexander, and thank you, Michael. And I. As everyone is sharing, I'm, I'm mindful of a statement that a colleague uh, in Sydney Goodwill used to say all the time, we have all the time in the world and it's the only place we have it. And it's this kind of turnaround that I'll uh, speak for myself, that this surrender that you spoke of, Michael, and um, the mention of resistance earlier. and. Uh, it's the liberation from resistance so that we live from the inside out instead of the outside in. So it seems, for me at least, it's that point of identification. And when we identify within life itself, within the life aspect itself, as Katya just mentioned, it, it, we become one with that rhythm. And when that happens, that discipline of freedom even melts away to simply live life one present moment at a time. So thank you and thank you for all the sharing within this webinar as together uh, we touch we touch that place within all of us where freedom resides. Thanks Doc. Yeah, we have time for more sharing. <laughs> it's whatever is needed. Whatever needs to be said, we have time for it. Michael, I don't have a function to raise my hand. May I share? Please. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it, we all experience that time can be very unlinear. And at some point, I started noticing that the when we start living in a rhythmical manner and start observing the the rhythm of cycles, then there's certain moments that Chiron switches to Kairos, and there's so much intensity could be lived within any single. Uh, moment and I think it's uh, uh, it's somewhere in the book said that the, the one of the mysteries of initiations related to the mystery of cycles it's 
when we start living, observing those different cycles, including astrological cycles, we open up to completely new dimensions of that qualitative experience of time. Thank you. Are there any other hands raised? Uh, Deisha and Rosie. Hi, Rosie, you're unmuted. Okay, thank you very much. Hi, Michael. Uh, Hi, was, Rosie. <laughs> amazing your talk and how you are being leading us to the liberation. Um, for me, I was thinking in myself and I think I was liberated somehow. And um, I always, uh, every single day in my meditation, I assert uh, my identification with the plan. And I sense that the plan is unfolding in a new, uh, in a new tone that we do not have to use some old language when we study, when we started to study. And in order to communicate now with young people, uh, we have to have that note of the liberation that we are processing. Probably we are talking about myself. I am not totally liberated, but I understand the new language, or at least uh, not even language, but to leave the process of the new things that we are receiving in order to transfer that into others. Uh, I'm, I, don't, I, I don't know if I am clear of what I want to express, but um, I am on with this process of liberation. Totally. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marina, please unmute yourself. Yes. Uh, how can I do it? Yes, we um, can hear you. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, no, I was thinking uh, um, of the about the courage that it requires uh, this process of liberation, because it has to do with the, with our deep identity. It's like. Uh, uh, we are requested, what is um, requested to us uh, is to be able to remain at least for a while and sometime, it, it, it is a long while, uh, without a previous uh, identity. And uh, this is the most difficult thing to, to do, at least according with my experience, uh, living our everyday life in the outer form and being efficient in the outer forms. And while the, our point of identity is shifting and we know what we are uh, not anymore, um, but we don't know yet uh, what, uh, what we are becoming, what we are going to become. And um, this is what Agni Yoga names uh, as uh, uh, quotes, as uh, uh, being able to walk on the edge of a precipice. And uh, I believe that this is a very important learning. This is an experience, an inner experience that we usually we try to avoid it because it's not pleasant at all. But uh, sooner or later, we need to learn to have the courage to walk on the on the on the edge of a precipice, and it's there at that point that a higher help, a higher inspiration, uh, can penetrate our our being. Um, and um, also, I connect this with the with the present collective moment, because. Um, Whatever is falling apart in our world is really helping us, is helping us accelerating 
accelerating this the, the death of our previous identity so that a new point of identity is found uh, in the depth uh, of ourselves and um, and so i believe that group uh, um, doing it uh, going through this process as a group uh, or um, as brothers and sisters and supporting each other and knowing understanding what the other person is living is extremely important because this is um, a kind of anchor um, to save ourselves from from too much pain and too much uh, fear also so therefore i believe this is uh, the great opportunity of our time thank you oh thank you marina uh, for me, you've highlighted a very important point about identity, is that whenever I use the word I am, whatever I follow it with, I've asserted my identity. I am Michael, I am this, uh, whatever role I play, rather than I am a soul working through a form called Michael, <laughs> working through um, a form of service called, well, in my case, Meditation Mount or something like that. I'm not over-identified with the form. I believe that standing as the new group of world servers, I believe there is a need to let go of the idea that we're holding around the new group of world servers so that the actual power and beauty that is this field of love and light and consecration um, comes alive rather than saying I belong to the new group of world service like belong to a club we don't belong to a club we are joined in co-resonant relationship the new group of world service for me is a co-resonant relationship of beings who are vibrating at a certain frequency a certain stage on the path and we see ourselves as part of a great chain of blessing and so thank you marina that's really important and you talk about surrender we know that one of the words of power is to dare so we this requires daring and it's for me the toughest thing to let go of is what i believe to be true because there is the fear that if I let go of it, I am nothing. It's how do we dare to step in to the unknown and to the uncertain with a sense that there only exists truth. And to the degree we release ourselves into that truth, we allow it to grow through us as we grow into it. I'm thinking of surrender. I, there was, there's a person, I won't name her, she's in her 90s, she's still alive. <laughs> she was w one, of, one of the people that inspired me the most. She never got flustered, never got hurried or worried by time, and she always did so much. And one day I, I said, how do you do it? And she looked at me and said, I relax into full activity. <laughs> And it's like, oh, and it took me a while to understand that she was saying, I allow the soul to control the outer form. When I step into the deeper aspect of myself, the soul, its natural urge is to serve. And therefore, it knows how to gather the resources together to accomplish a task. And it does it joyfully. I have never seen anybody who could handle so many things and be calm and graceful. And her answer was, I simply relax into full activity. So that stayed with me as, as guidance of it is possible. And this is what it means to have the soul control the outer form. So I believe that we're going through a disidentification as a new group of world servers, not to disband the reality of the new group of world servers, but to let go of any thought forms around it that don't truly correspond to its note. And that's the beauty. 
sacred geometry doesn't lie. <laughs> the aura doesn't lie. We can distort facts and fake news, as we know, to contort the truth to, to speak whatever we wish it to speak. Um, when you sound a note, particularly we know when you sound a note in a, a, a sand tray, the different particles of sand rearrange themselves in a pattern that corresponds to the outpicturing of that particular frequency. So if we think of the, the deep purpose of the, the Logos, the deep purpose of Gaia, as this note that's being sounded, then as we create a field that is open and receptive, this living story can show up inside us as our daily lives. And I believe that's what we are seeking to do as we choose to live the new story. Um, I'll, I, I had a very deep experience earlier this year when I was in New Zealand and Australia. And some of you have heard this, but I want to say it because it is a whole shift in, in my relationship, not only with time, but also with the planet. And if you hear a noise in the background, there's a helicopter coming over my, my house at the moment, but that's just life on the planet in 2019. So when I was in Australia and New Zealand, I got this deep sense of the gift of the Southern Hemisphere is to help us understand how creation is sung into being. There are song lines. Everything we see around us has been sung into creation by the Creator. And I had the sense that all of us now are being asked to sing the new story of creation, to sing the new song lines of the new civilization. And one of my favorite Nicholas Rurick um, images or paintings is, of course, the mother of the world. And I was reflecting on the mother of the world and actually contemplating this image. And I had the sense that the mother of the world is beginning to lift her veil. And I had this experience of when the mother of the world begins to lift her veil, everything becomes silent. And I had the experience of utter silence. And then the silence was broken by a sweet singing. And it was the mother of the world singing in the new world, singing in the new Gaia, singing in the new incarnation of herself. And it was very profound because it wasn't something I read. It was something that was given to me because of the way that the indigenous peoples of Australia and New Zealand had held the field for the story to be sung. And so it was easier for me to get a sense of how the living story is attempting to enter us. So as well as writing the story, I believe it's seeking to sing itself through us. It's the song of the soul of humanity. And so in order to sing, we have to train our voice. We have to get rid of all the impediments and distortions that would make this voice less than true. And so for me, living the new story and, and the act of liberation eventually allows us to sing a new song from the depths of our heart in response to the song that is held in the heart of the ashram of the Christ, the heart of the ashram that is the heart of this planet and held by the mother who if, if we see her as an embodiment of space. So time and space, time is simply that in which to find God. Space is simply that in which the seeds of the creator are planted and they grew. And through Kairos, they go through their cycles. So I had to bring all this back down to earth because this was a very deep experience and I carry it with me 
as the call. The call that I have received, and I believe we are receiving, is the call to sing in the new world together. But not just as humans, to do it together with the chorus that is the fifth kingdom. To do it with the chorus that is the angelic realms. To do it with the chorus of lives that are the inhabitants of the natural realms. The gnomes, the fairies, the elves, the undines, the sylphs. It's the whole sacred ecosystem of the planet is being upgraded. And when I need an upgrade on my computer, I just click on it and it says download and install. The upgrades that we are being required to make require us to let go of the old applications, to let go of the old thought forms and welcome in the new. And I believe the, the, the most joyful way of, of upgrading the planet is for us to liberate ourselves and for us to sing this new song together as part of the sacred ecosystem. So that's really all that I have to share at this time. And I would welcome any reflections that we may have about what the living story or what the new story means to each of us. As we did before, put something in the chat room uh, or raise your hand and speak. And after we've done that, we'll close with a, a final alignment to anchor the story inside the group heart. So please share whatever needs to be shared. Alexander, if you could read anything that gets posted, I'd appreciate that. And also, if anyone wants to speak, simply raise your hand and we will unmute your microphone. I think now we all experiencing that silence of collective singing. There are several people who are muted, so if anyone would like to say anything, please, or those who are muted on your own side, please unmute yourself. Yes, hello, this is Martin. Can you hear me? Yes. There's a synchronicity in that this morning I just happened to look up the words present, past, and future in the Bailey books, and I found in Dinah 1 this uh, statement, which was new to me. Um, it likens the phrase, I am that with the future. So I'd like to read that because it connects the mother that Michael just spoke so beautifully about to the father. So this is a meditation given to one of the disciples and it's very brief. And it says, relax and focus yourself in the soul, then sound the Om breathing it out upon the world of men and saying to yourself inaudibly, the will of God moves the world. This is the thought lying behind your use of the Om. Then ponder the significance of time as an expression of the will, realizing that this expression is a thought instantaneous and effective in the mind of the planetary logos. Think out carefully some of the implications of this last statement. 
Then say slowly and thoughtfully, the past is gone. I am that past. It makes me what I am. The future comes. I also am the coming destiny. And therefore, I am that. The present flows from out the past. The future colors that which is. I make the future also by my present knowledge of the past and the beauty of the present. And therefore, I am that I am. Thank you, Martin. Alexandra, maybe you could show the um, slide of the home. Alexander, that would be a good one. Yes, wonderful. Thank you. We talk about a sustainable world. We want to build a sustainable civilization. But when you look at the word sustainable, it's really connected to the duration of the note over time. It's a sustaining note. So the truly sustainable society is one that has the note of divine purpose, the note of love and light and spiritual power at its core. And we're told that this particular glyph, this particular ohm, this particular sound is that which sustains all forms. And if the creator were to stop singing, we would disappear. <laughs> Is there anyone else that wishes to share before we go into our closing alignment? Either by chatting, text, or if you need to say something. There are two raised hands. Uh, so if Margot or Robin, you would like to share anything, please unmute yourself. Yes, this is Robin. And um, Michael, you're, you're um, speaking in terms of singing in this new age makes gives it, two thoughts surface. One about how much DK talks to us about the throat center and its significance. And second, um, just in the last week or two, I made a note to myself uh, uh, where to try to ground more <laughs> this reality. Uh, the quality of my own voice is an indication of where I am focused and where my attention is. So what am I singing through my voice? Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Michael, if uh, I may, I would want to share um, before we started the webinar, uh, 
we briefly looked into the slides that we would like to show and um, there are uh, several slides that I showed to Michael that we can show on the screen and I so sh showed the image of the blue marble and the image of the earth as a map and Michael said now we will be using the Im we can use the image of the marble because the map it's it's just a projection and we better use the actual earth image because and I I think it's such a beautiful symbol for what we're talking today about is that the teaching is that it's a map but the actual teaching the true teaching is what we know from within and that's what K calls us at the beginning of every book only if it resonates within you and is part of your experience then accept it so maps are good but then we should know it from within at some point yes i love maps I did a lot of mountaineering and, and rock climbing in Scotland when I lived in Scotland, and I would buy these maps, and I would some of them I'd have on the wall. I'd because because I'd been there before, I could retrace my steps, and I knew where things were. And yet, the map is not the territory; it's not the domain itself. And, and I I believe what we're doing is daring to step into the livingness of our relationship with Gaia daring to step into the livingness of our relationship with the fifth kingdom. And the fifth kingdom, as we know, is simply that collective um, consciousness, that group of souls who are the full flowering of that which we still aspire to. Um, as my friend Donald Keyes would call them, they're the postgraduate humans. They've graduated with degree with an honor and um, we're on the same path and and that's why why for me it's taking it out of the realm of elevated beings out of my reach to this is a level of consciousness that i can touch just as robin was saying the, the tone of my voice the quality of my voice when i'm in touch with a, a deep sense of compassion and love in my heart my the words that i speak will convey that energy we are connected through resonance. And um, it, it goes back to the science of harmonics. I believe we're, we're now experiencing what Pythagoras, Pythagoras was teaching us in his mystery school, not as a study course, but he's, Pythagoras in, is inviting us to live, to become the sacred geometry the sacred geometry of the fourth and the fifth merging. Um, the sacred geometry of the contained in the statement of, uh, that we've been reflecting on in the past months in the 2025 initiative of synthesis is, but unity must be created. This reality is synthesis, but in order for it to be born, we have to create the unified conditions where there is a resonant relationship between heaven and earth and so it's it's all very simple <laughs> and it's all very challenging because the, the the attachments that i'm discovering go deep but many lifetimes now's the time to liberate ourselves so that a new something new can be born on the planet through us so i would invite us now to enter again that living silence of the group heart seeing ourselves standing together as one each one of us a flame of love. Together, the fire of love.
Let us place all that is worn, all that is no longer needed, all that has served us up to now that no longer serves the present and the future. Let us lovingly and gratefully place this in the fire of love and let it be consumed. And in this field of purity, the fire has created. Let us open ourselves as a group chalice, as a receptive field, to be impressed by the song of Gaia, the note of planetary purpose, as it seeks to sing its song through another round of seasons, through a new civilization. And with the ears of the group heart, we hear the song that is the new story. And we let it resound within every fiber of our being. Let's breathe this in again. And as we continue our journey in the coming weeks and months and years, some of us will be on the planet for a few more years. Some of us will be returning to the subtle realms and continuing the work from there. We come in and out of time all the time. But what endures is the one life and the soul of humanity of which we are an intimate and integral part. So let us continue to support each other so that we may allow a new earth to be born. Thank you. And we have one minute left, Alexandra, for whatever needs to be done. Thank you. Let's just keep this silence and we'll end in silence. <laughs> 